uh, final reading in this season's French of the Public Library Poetry Series. Uh, we received funding from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, among other people, for which we are grateful. And I'd like briefly just to announce a couple of other poetry events in the area upcoming. Uh, Tuesday, April 23rd, Mobile Poets and Writers will be featuring, will have an open reading featuring Holly Camille. Uh, May 19th, Poetry Workshop, an open reading with Maria Gillan. And anybody interested in getting in on that uh, workshop, you can pick up one of these brochures. We'll give you information out in the lobby. Uh, Monday, April 15th, Mulberry Poets and Writers will be sponsoring a poetry discussion group, which I will be leading here in the Wilkins Center. And at the Penn State Wilkesbury campus in Lehman, the 8th Annual Hayfield Poetry Festival is coming up on Saturday, April 20th. And there will be some flyers out in the, in the lobby giving you information about that as well. Uh, tonight, we're very glad to have David Ray with us. He's published over a dozen books of poetry and fiction. Uh, some of them have received significant awards, including the William Carlos Williams Award. Uh, two of his more recent books, published by Wesleyan University Press, are Sam's book, and most recently, The Maharani's New Wall. That book details many of his experiences during the year that he spent in India teaching. And he has taught at other places around the world, but his primary teaching assignment is at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, where he has come to join us from. Uh, whether writing about the places that he's traveled, or about his boyhood in Oklahoma Dust Bowl, or many other subjects, his voice has been a compelling one <coughs> in recent American poetry. And I'm very glad to be able to present to you tonight David Ray. Take the life of a climber or two weekly 
but never with malice. It's well into August. Hiroshima's Yarzite just passed. Nagasaki's tomorrow. One day of peace in between. Lucky seventh. Sit in your boat, love. A haiku will do for the day. Nothing world shaking. And later we'll walk up the trail on that slope that walls the world out. A foxtail spray in your hand, an elk horn in mine. I should have reminded you, of course, August 7th comes right between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Yarzite is the anniversary of the death. Uh, we were talking at dinner uh, a bit about the Lindbergh case. And this is um, called Portrait of Charles Lindbergh, 1930. It's a little bit slanderous. Uh, it's based on uh, an epigraph here by an unnamed socialite in 1930. He made his uh, transatlantic flight in 1927. So this was said uh, three years later. He'd be working in a gas station near St. Louis if he hadn't had a stroke of luck. And a lot of people agree that that was about the luckiest flight there ever was. I mean, he had the tailwinds all the way and so on. Not your ordinary gas station attendant, this man in coveralls with the fair and flopping hair, the wide smile bending down to ask if you want regular or ethyl. And what about your oil? His name is Lindbergh. Not long ago he flew planes over the state fairgrounds, wild loops, acrobatics, wing walking, and at night flew the mail to Chicago, bailed out a few times when the weather got rough. In fog and rain and snow, he floated down in his harness, twisting and turning, for the plane would spiral, sputter and spin, coming at him. But luck seemed to be with him. Then, in 27, they asked if he would enter the contest. 33 hours or so over the sea, safer than flying the mail, he said, just follow the ship lanes. Make sure there's a tailwind, good weather, take along enough fuel, just steer straight ahead. It would lead on, they said, to fame, glory, riches. It might lead on to greatness, whatever that is. Nope, he said, wolfing his burger at Max Diner on the edge of the airport. It's about time I came down to earth. A man's got to be realistic, get himself a good job one of these days, something steady. He clangs the zinc nozzle back against the red gurgling pump then stoops to check your tires with his gauge and gives each a kick. So that's how history would have turned out differently if Charles Lindbergh had decided not to enter the contest. Moment by the pool. World by the pumice stone, cold pool near the Shinto temple, smell of honeysuckle, strong, and our orchid ladies dangling over the rail, we regard our karma of this life, the carp both orange and black, and even one old white guru, fish who is so wise, he does not dream of everything at once. Pool shivers in the moonlight, and we've let down so many burdens off our backs, we float as free as these wise carp at least tonight, at least this holy instant. Well, we'll travel now to India, and I lived there for a year, as I mentioned. And uh, this one is called The Bicycle Boy. The boy pumps your tire for 10 paise, a coin of aluminum you drop into his hand. You make your stop quick as you can because of the filth, dirt rising, trying to get you. The gutter he stands in has the detritus of years blowing about, coiled hair deeply embedded, paper mashed down like gold foil, dust of pack, past ages packed hard as cement. You drop the coin so his hand won't reach up and touch yours. One night you roared by in a rickshaw with sputtering motor and saw that he sleeps there in shadows. Christ, how could anyone let him? 
No wonder his sores fester, not ten yards away from an open front drugstore. Yet no cure is cheap enough for him and his caste. You have meant to resign care and concern, a trade for which you've been punished, a skill best left to others, but the rest of that night you see him as if in a dream that's stuck and won't move. He's wrapped in his shawl, and you wait and weep like a fool for the world. And this is the yogi by the roadside. Bicycling past, I glimpse the holy man, absurd with his face painted like some silly child as he squats rain by flowers and fruit under his thatch over dust, his little god before him in stone and his music blaring from under the bench, a desolate sight in the sun, yet within minutes. I am struck by a strange holy light, soaked in bliss as I float on my infinite wheels spinning off into heaven humming. This one's just called trees. <clears throat> the great tree born in Christ's time is clawed into chips in a few seconds. The mill fed every instant of the year, its hungry maw, merciless. Deals are made. Trees to Japan, trees to Europe, trees into rayon, trees into newsprint. Men value their own parts, but not those of the forest. Cut down the old trees, and you kill the eagle, the bear, and the sap. The lichen that might yet yield a cure for us. Cut down the tree, and you cut down the butterfly burying your soul. I was uh, actually quite near here when this Three Mile Island thing happened, um, and uh, wrote this poem about it. It's called Extreme Unction in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, some of you would, but um, Harold, somebody from the Atomic Energy Commission, was speaking of the imminence of a hydrogen explosion and didn't say anything about what that meant. Well, the public really didn't know whether that meant a chain reaction or, or what. It was a very scary event. It's still a scary event, really. In any case, um, I wrote this poem at that time. No, not the last, last supper, and yet, for the sake of the world, I mumbled all the holy poems I knew. They too were dying. Outside the silver diner, rain fell and fell. And from the south came wind that bore the glowing mask, danced the silly saffron mask of hell. And though I dreaded walking out, inhaling tiny drifts from Satan's mills that stood upon the earth like pots of clay, turned on a loving wheel, I try to tip my hat to the waitress to keep her calm. Go down gentle, I hope to say. Stay still upon your stools, all you chubby drivers, innocent and hungry, and feathered ladies on some worldly journey. The sky went dark, trees were trembling. We had our share of cobalt blue, but heavy lead had followed, and iodine like that blind homer kicked upon the shore, seaweed. Buddha's tree. All the way to Benares, and I failed to go those last few miles, sit beneath Buddha's tree. I hope to return, this time walk those last few miles, sit where great Buddha sat, clawing my way back to India only to see Buddha's tree. And yet I know the best 
is the one in my <coughs> own backyard. There's Buddha's distant tree, though only in my mind I fear. And maybe not Buddha's tree, just mine. Oh, pitiable tree, indeed. Uh, I don't know who it was. Someone said all our troubles come from our inability to sit in one room. Proof. <laughs> remember who that was? Sometimes it seems very true. Well, here's one that's really up to date, although it was published uh, three or four years ago. I was actually thinking of another war, the one you've got the uh, statue for, over the courthouse. Flags here under glass, patched where hot shells ripped through, stitched and restitched with its stars waggled off center, shaken where earth trembled, blood red and scarlet and plum make a triad of color, impressed from stamping mill, high moment of battle, improvised use as a shroud. And you could still smell if you cracked this display case, the cordite and smoke stench of those bodies, when at last flag rested too over the livid limp scene, and you think of them racing over the slopes straight into firing lines, men busy with rampole and scope and cranking the crude aiming devices of that age, ratcheting cannon barrels till they pointed to sky or a distant ridge, men running there like mechanical toys, and you ask in your awe why these men flung straight into hell, feared this fire less than woman, bloom, and all the joys that they fled in a land of serenity no one has yet made a flag for. Uh, I don't know why we got into this ecology thing. Uh, don't want to bring people down very far, but this is Black Elk Speaks. When Black Elk went up to the hills to perform his lamentations, calling them out to the four corners, he had dressed in a sacred manner and had decided to be true to his vision. He already knew it would not happen. The tree centered heavy with blossoms and the hoop drawing his people together. He knew life was no better than it was when they had rubbed out yellow hair. But in his mind, Black Elk floated over the teepees and came down feet first at the center of the hoop where he could see the tree all green, its branches loaded with flowers. And it was time to see the fathers and to know the other world. Others joined him, their hands raised to the west. The nation we have is in despair, they sang to the powers. The new earth you promised has proved to be a false picture. And yet they saw that the day was as perfect as ever, surely the creation of some spirit. And then to the dark river and the stars, all who were doomed sang of their vision, as a hundred years later the children of long hair must chant it again, having poisoned their earth, having betrayed their visions, Black Elk saw the dark clouds gather and the sacred tree dead, foresaw toys in the sky and great fires. He rode down to Grass Creek, to smoky earth, as if to the battle, already lost, already won. There's a woman in Kansas City, Marlo Morgan, who's writing a book about the experience she had out in Australia with the Aboriginals. And uh, she was out there studying uh, their use of herbal medicines and things like that. And uh, the landlady where she was staying said, the Aboriginals have heard that you're around here and they want to honor you, to give you an award. So they, uh, so she, uh, bought the best dress she could find and got all dressed up and put on every piece of jewelry she had and got driven out to the edge of town and, and met by the aboriginals and uh, they took her to the campfire and um, she was getting ready for her award and uh, the lady said, well first you must be cleansed so uh, you have to take off all your clothes. She took off all her clothes and then uh, watched in consternation as 
the lady picked up her clothes, jewels too, and threw them in the fire. So much for that. Then she brought a sarong wrapped around her. She's still waiting for the award. When I go over, they have to have a ceremonial meal first. Uh, they're gathering food. It turns out to be uh, grub worms. They wrap them in leaves and uh, roast them. And she remembered her mother telling her she should never eat a worm, but she had to try it to be nice because then otherwise it wouldn't get the award. So they had their meal and then uh, they said, next we sleep. And so they slept there on the ground and the next morning uh, she was waiting for the award and they said, well, first we must uh, do a walkabout. And she said, well, how far do we walk? How long do we walk? Uh, three phases of the moon. Three months? Yes, three months. Well, this gal was gay. She decided uh, that's what I have to do to get the award. So uh, anyway, they walked for three months, and her feet became hooves. And uh, this goes on and on in some ways. She learned a lot of things from those people, a great many things. But I don't want to tell you about her book. I'm just finishing a poem about it. But um, finally, the showdown arrived. It's either got to be the award or nothing. So she presses them. This is after living on snakes and worms and leaves and becoming a homeopathic wonder of uh, leaf bark medicine and things like that. And uh, they said, oh, yes, the award we have for you. The day, the wonderful day, it was light again. Don't you wish we looked at the world that way? And she took it. She said it was the greatest award she ever got. She has never since waked up without appreciating the award. Okay, I'm trying to get that in a poem. I hope she doesn't sue me. But think about it. Okay, this poem is called The Awkwardness Among Men. Since my son's death, two grown men have told me they would like to be my son. Strange confession to share. Having had this thought, felt this feeling for some time, but daring to tell me only after some years, as if the lava had cooled now, the broken night lashed back into place, time brought forward again for our use, for the saying and healing, and even new growth. And therefore I myself would say to my older friend, whose son was shot down in a forest as he fled, a drunken, unemployed fool, John, let me be your son. What does that mean? It does not mean I think I could replace that great chunk of his life missing. It is some deep urge to comfort and appeasement. It is also that, a way of saying, please, my friend, do not take it out on me. I know how the rage holds on, how it waits in the sun like a crocodile, how it springs up with the monstrous trap of its jaws when you think that at last you can stroll along, forgetful. No, my friend, I know your rage. And I too pace out the days that should have been my sons. Let us be friends then, fathers and sons to one another. Share the abrazo of Quakers who do not believe in so much that is foul and loathsome around us. And let me accept the honor from these two others who outrage me with their confessions. Two grown and foolish men asking a boy, a mere boy, to be their father, to stroll along in the forest, and let me set aside my fear that they mean only to sanctify guns again and to hunt. Because that's what the company of men has become is the violence. 
Um, okay, this uh, poem I just did the other day, but it's an impression that was kicking around for eight years. And it's called First Day in India. First day in India, you ask, here's how it was. 16 rupees for airport baggage. Was that a bribe, Bakshish? Then six for tips, hotel 495, lunch 40, we slept till noon. Our dinner, 65, tea, 22. Goddamn five star overcharge. Then one rosy pelican, my beloved beer. For only 20, big amber bottle sipped in corner. Eurasian whore at her table all alone. I almost went to her long bare arms. Breakfast next day, 90. Excessive, we knew already. Chauffeur picked us up in midget limo, just right for me and you. The two girls gawking, nose out windows, bags tied on top, free ride through utter hell, honk, part sea of wailing woe. Girls spot first sacred cow, then camels, holy man stark naked, 10,000 roaring rickshaws, blue smoke swirls around. At last, Lal stops and we step out. Confront a thousand years ago, some scene from the mill's technicolor epic. My master plan, I've thought for months, is this. And now it's time to start. No guilt, because we're just not meant to be here. Our karma called for home, not here. And thus, we move through hell, as if not here at all, invisible. Sidestep those begging hands. Through bars, a man counts out a stack of bills for me because I am so worthless. Never meant to be here, but my plan won't work. They starve for me, and every face doth show it. I damn well know it. And this um, is another about India, it's called The Woman. And the epigraph here is from the World Bank Report. Women do two-thirds of the world's work. That's official. I don't know why it wasn't five-sixths or six-eighths or one. Anyway, it's two-thirds of the world's work. It isn't work, what she does. Any man can tell you that. She's up to make the tea and breakfast well before the sunrise. Can't join him in his meditative stroll, his mantra chanting in the park. I've seen her squat before her fire, lifting the chapati on the grill, flopping it over. Each bite consumed by him and all their little ones has had her touch, her watching eye, the smallest child nurses as she works, and three or four others watch. It's life from scratch each day, we might say. For these chapatis, she must tote the water for several miles. She'll place brass jugs upon her head, one upon another, a tower toward the sky. Since childhood, she's not spilled one. And grain's essential. She cuts it with her scythe, back bent, winnows it in the wind, chaff blows free, and then she grinds the grains by hand. All that's for the first item of the day. But she must gather wood to feed that fire, and cow dung is worth its weight in gold. She scoops it up, heaves those chunks into her basket, still steaming, competing with all the other women. And if she owns a cow or a goat, there's grass to gather up, also miles away. The children help her now and then, gather grass, her task. Her husband gathers friends around his hammock in the yard. They pass their pipe around, men's work. Of course, he's pumped his rickshaw through the town, and that's hard work. Asked why she loves him, she says, because he gives me food and clothes. On further thought, she adds, because he'll beat me if I don't. She'd like to see the sunset, but there's evening's work to do and nights.
guys are about the quietest uh, people I have run across for a long time. Is that because it's 7.30 reading? Well, <laughs> thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Gave him a dollar and got exactly a dollar. <laughs> thank you, Richard. Here's a, here's a very short poem called Skid Row. Thin curtain bellowing out, endlessly begging in the night. And in the morning, the last pennies out of a can for a plum. Okay, here is the uh, note. Dad, have no feeling for you anymore. Can lay your snapshot on the table and not be moved to tears. Your ancient mustache and the plaid of your sport coat collar, your slick tie with the wings of herons, I am unmoved. Somebody read that one time and said, why aren't you removed when you think of your father? Uh, the family, rounding up the family one chick and kitten at a time, I see that even the fly on the barn wall becomes someone for whom I was searching. And then I wrote this poem because I thought I had stolen it from Sappho. It's called After Sappho. Let us live so that the rust of our bodies will rub off on others in future years. And then I met Willis Barnstone, Sappho's translator, and he said, Dave, that's your poem. It's not in Sappho. <laughs> the last. Okay, here's the greatest poem in the world. This is for the Mulberry poets. May it happen to you. I'm sure it already has. Once in Crete, I was asleep near the sea. The room was cold, and I woke with the greatest poem ever about to be written in my head. I heard waters running under stone, search for light, search for fire, nothing. Shivering, wrote the poem on the sheet in the dark. It was a great poem. And first thing in the morning to celebrate, I ran out and took a swim. It was marvelous to have written the greatest poem in the world. I can tell you that. It summed up everything. On the way back from the seas, great reward and kiss of me. I saw the women doing laundry <coughs> in a huge boiling pot, three women, as in Macbeth. They had already washed away the greatest poem in the world with their greatest pot in the world, and I hadn't memorized it. The sea had taken it. And I stood weeping in the smoke, wind hitting the caverns in my stupid head. Well, here's another one about poetry. Understanding poetry. Buffalo Bill by E. e. Cummings is on page 50. I can never find it right before class. When girls are biting their fingernails and looking out the window with classic boredom, and we're going to discuss Buffalo Bill by E. e. Cummings and why he uses the word defunct for Bill instead of dead, passed away, kaput, kick the bucket, went on to the happy hunting ground, expired like grandma in the telegram, and whether or not it's a better poem than trees, like Lewis Kilmer. <laughs> okay, this is called The Tramp's Cup. It was the uh, title poem of one of my books. And uh, it starts with an epigraph from Hilda Dula. I will rise from my trough with the dead. I will sweeten my cup. Easier said than done. A thousand poverties come home daily to beg what spirit we have to incite old evil burning on in the bones. And I am asked to do it without wine. Once in Yorkshire, a tramp came begging to our damp brick farm. His life's possessions and the baby's pram he pushed along hedgerows, talking to sheep, 
We gave him tea and watched him settle down for the night in a grass-lined ditch, wind blowing over him, stars burning clear above him as he chuckled and sipped the cooling tea, pulling over him the frail tent he had made, using the pram for a north wall. I know why he laughed and felt free. All one really needs is to keep out of the dam. He had learned that well and had not an enemy in the world, had nothing to fear, nothing to lose, nothing to stop loving him. And thus he knew his cup of tea was sweet. Okay, the theme of missed opportunities flows in the dark. We are all in the room of the mind together. No matter how I didn't get across, how no one spoke or reached out, now that it's too late, love comes home like a lamb of your own sacred spirit, still searching in all this snow. You find someone who seems to know all about it, who brings moonlight into the room and pours it on all those broken flowers. So, uh, I have just a little bit more of India. The rickshaw wallet told us. We should see the Taj in moonlight. And full moon was out that night. Thousands jammed the streets. We knew they scanned long pools to catch that moon. And love's monument. Orgasm captured once and for all time in white stone, except for refinery air, not visible at night. And many trudged, no doubt, into that tomb of love remembered well, to see by candle flame where Moontaz, queen much adored, still lay beneath her inlaid stone, carnation red carnelian, green stems of emeralds. But we stayed behind in that cheap hotel, and later swore we saw it, Taj in moonlit splendor. So now you know what the Taj Mahal is about. You mentioned this poem, Mamala Purim, didn't you? In Mamala Purim by the sea, you saw half-naked men digging the shells of peanuts tossed in mud. They searched through each one, already cleaned out, and would lick even a thin, papery red skin. You, my daughters, saw that in India, something I once saw in America, while dirigibles floated in the skies, when we boys burned Hitler in our trash barrels, when alleys were crowded with hobos, men bending, stooping, searching, and you saw a blind beggar speaking Tamil, begging of another, who turned up his face, pointing to his own eyes, saying, friend, I am one of you. Then another led him toward us, foreigners who would be his salvation, and he showed us the gaping wounds of his eyes. I took you halfway round our globe for that, not for the world's greatest bar relief, elephant and granite slipping down mountains to the Ganges, but for those beggars, so you might see them, believe them, know how it was, how it will be, our eyes burning like fire, our wounds gaping and red and accusing. Well, why don't you write about something cheerful? I'm looking. <laughs> okay, here's uh, something on the lighter side called Hatch. It's probably about sorrow or something. Hatch. When I first saw that old man in his red turban, nearly toothless, 
I thought he was a holy man, a sannyasi for sure. Such a wondrous spirit, his smile like a child's, forgiving, as if he had guessed my sins, candid, wise. Now I know him better, and he offers me hashish, some of his. And we sit on the veranda of Sohan Singh's hotel, and Sohan says, go ahead, this old man loves you. Wants you to have some of his hash. But I just sit smiling and admiring that enlightened, remarkable holy man in his red turban with his human secret. Hell, it's not a secret. He offers it to everyone. The tourist women in their new saris, the collector of used bottles, castrato singers at the fountain, shepherd kids who pass with goats, and all who laugh or cry with him. And then here's one about Gandhi. Um, <coughs> We, you quote some, in India, you add the little suffix, uh, suffix I-J-I uh, for an affectionate name. A statue of Gandhiji. From our window on the second floor, we can look out level at the statue of Gandhi. A silhouette in dust raised high on a marble plinth. He steps out with a staff as into the bustle of the modern mob high above rickshaws, camels, strolling cows. As it grows dark, he looks like a peacock, his shawl and folded feathers he never unfurled in pride, nor would he, I think, have raised himself so high. To honor men, we make them truly shadows of themselves, their small and fragile selves. Okay, I think I shall read this two-page poem, so buckle your seatbelts. Uh, I'm doing this just for my own fun, you know. Uh, the Hundred-Year-Old Scotch in Rajasthan. When I drank the Hundred-Year-Old Scotch, we were sitting at a long table on a terrace and were much admired, the turban Rajputs and I by the villagers gazing over the waist-high walls. We were well served and expansive, having eaten our fill more than once and already paraded through the mud streets to the joyous accompaniment of everyone who could move, whether on crutches or carried in arms. And the music was made by whatever drum they could play or tin horn. Somehow, the noise managed its message medieval. I was proud to be for once with the winners, the aristocrats. It must have been clear to all that I was the honored foreigner, and yet I was aware that it was not, so to speak, personal. Any foreigner would do. Simply being there made me a god. Well into evening, the bearers kept filling my cup, and when we moved on to the castle for dinner, on a turreted roof, sitting in great easy chairs as Arab sheiks do in movies, the food was hot with spices, so I had to drink more and more, there being no water save what was hauled from the step well, and I had already seen them bathing there, stepping down to the square pool and having a good splash, washing their hair as well as their bodies, then drinking from cupped hands. None of that stuff for me, not for a Westerner. So I kept drinking the pleasant amber-colored scotch and asking of one beaming host after another, if this was indeed not the hundred-year-old scotch. And was assured again and again, I was in effect <coughs> drinking pure gold, liquefied. Dawn found me walking out under palms through the fields, for all India as a toilet has been well and accurately said. The man at my side on a similar quest, the Rajput aristocrat with great mustaches and bronze skin said, Saab, we are so happy you are alive this morning. <laughs> we thought you would surely be dead. I had one hell of a headache and I trembled, but the main thing was that I needed a place in the fields to squat. Others were already busy at it, spread out, each with a little bucket set beside him, water for washing. What do you mean, I asked. That hundred-year-old scotch was terrific, but I drank more than I should. Headache was not all that I throbbed from. 
And the man laughed like a demon of swords. He stopped in the sun rising and gilding the fields. Then he laughed wildly, almost in hysterics. Hundred-year-old sky sob. That was only our first drink. The rest was from here in the village. They used the old car radiators for distillers. <coughs> Already this year, six die in this village alone. <laughs> the lead in those car parts, it is poison, sob. But why, I asked him, almost in tears, not sure now. <laughs> not sure now I'd live to eat breakfast or until noon or even until I managed to squat in the field. Why did that bearer keep serving me? Oh, sob, the Rajput explained, you liked it a lot. <laughs> we Rajputs could see that. And we remarked to each other how happy you were. That bearer, he wished to be nice. <laughs> nice, I yelled, <coughs> knowing maybe I'd die from it. Oh, yes, he said, for that is our custom. We must always be nice. <laughs> I was not well enough to continue <coughs> this discourse. So I staggered on till a few riverside rushes gave me the chance to touch Mother Earth and deposit half or more of my body. Then some of my tears, while much of me died there, came to know what the phrase meant, 100 years of solitude, which I then suffered within one square yard of Indian earth. And yet I recall it gleaming like gold, the first glass of that 100-year-old scotch in Rajasthan, and how those eyes over the wall admired and envied me for drinking it, holding the glass up for another and another. <laughs> this is a sonnet called Old Paul from Sam's book. Um, it has an epigraph from Clough called uh, I've often that reads, I've often wondered how it is at times good people do what are as bad as crimes. Now that also seems right up to date, doesn't it? I've often wondered how it is at times good people do what are as bad as crimes. Uh, how, do you remember Bhopal? Yeah. <clears throat> this one started with that famous picture that I believe was on the cover of the magazines uh, of the child who, uh, of one of the children. Eyes open, glazed like Isinglass. The fire behind, gone out. This child of Bhopal lies in his shallow grave of cinders. No time for weeping, as when we lost our son Sam, and stood hands joined to wish him well in some life beyond. In fact, he might have gone on to Bhopal just in time to die again at just three months. Not likely, but who knows. One thing that's certain, though, is this. Third world or one beyond, they're all our children now, though born by millions in brown arms and black, and not much mourned by those who think their own are wonders, others somehow less. And thus, I'll say goodbye to this son, too, and yours. I don't know, when you look at those pictures of the Kurds up in the mountains dying of cold and hunger, those are our children. Read just a little bit more of Sam's book. Um, sometimes I'm told that this sharing of grief uh, helps uh, people who carry these uh, burdens. Uh, this is called Tricks of the Mind, and it too has a little epigraph from the Epistle of Privy Council, way back when. So take a firm grip on yourself as best you can. Isn't that great advice? Use tricks of the mind, say the wise, and I'm willing to try. 
Just say it happened in the ancient days. Pretend that he went with the Greeks to their pagan kingdom, was perhaps that green boy of stone who plays his flute to this day on the terrace. And think of scenes worse, those children of Pompeii, or Bhopal, or Hiroshima. For here's a thought to consider. He had a short life, but a good one, and never partook of the evil. And that's true. So one trick of the mind may get through. And think of those cheated of even more life, how the grave digger stood with his shovel and said that his grandson lay near but died at 13. And he leaned on his shovel and wept. An old grave digger with no tricks of the mind. Another trick of the mind, out of a book, a little trick. Instead of the picture and much longing for that lost face, place yourself within the frame. You're back together again, if only in the past or in the dream, or this gilded picture in mind. But it is no longer a dream or a picture of loss. And then you go on, down the road you have to go, together. Just finish with uh, very short poems for Sam. The Temple at Pesta. This is in uh, southern Italy. Son, forgive me if for a moment when we saw the temple at Pestum on the sea, I thought the steps worn on that ancient stone. I'm sorry, I uh, want to start over again here. Son, forgive me if for a moment when we saw the temple at Pestum on the sea, I thought the steps worn on that stone had been by your ancient feet which ran before me. The apple that filled the room. What the young are not prepared for is the apple that fills the room. That is not how they proceed. They are not aware that one will grow and fill the rotten room. Let it be a yellow or a red delicious or one from another state. Let it be brown to the core with a sear leaf on the stem. Whatever apple has been brought in is the apple that will fill the room. They are hardly prepared to know. The snapshots. Had we known these few images were all we would have of you, we'd have been taking pictures all the time. The one I need to forget, to stop weeping, to live, is the one in my mind without looking. Teaching. If my lessons to him meant anything at all, I must listen to them now, for myself. Love your own body, I told him, the goodness of it. Let the love out, so beans of joy. And I tell now in front of the mirror where I caught him once smirking and naked, smiling's no sin. Despise no one, pray for even the hard-hearted, even the steel and rust-hearted. Dance a jig when you get out of the cool, turquoise as a god's eyes, as a sun's, as a stone's, for even a stone must be loved and wished well on its way through star after star. Okay, I'm going to finish with this one, Call Sun. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, read Jung and all those people and think about synchronicity, and uh, but it happens. A, a lot of it happens, doesn't it? Uh, today we had a nice little example. I hadn't picked that Hopkins passage because, of, you know, it was April 7th. Um, but uh, th this is uh, 
for, for, for a long time. Grief, of course, opens up that kind of experience. You're very open, and a door is open, as if to another world. You, you, uh, you, you're in touch with experiences that people ordinarily filter out and close down and, and, uh, and uh, make uh, light of, deny. Um, but um, there, there is a time in grief when you're very much in touch with that kind of experience. And this is, this is such a time. And this is called sun. That day at the pool, the little fellow and I spotted each other about the same time. He wore only a white sailor cap and laughed, red in both hands, waving those chunks toward me. His mother was holding him up, and she bent round and looked deep into his blue eyes to inquire why he was looking so intently at me. The foreign man half of fools went away. Why he had singled me out of dozens, all ages, a fairly big crowd. Of course she had no way of knowing. His eyes refused to leave mine, latched onto me, and he tried to wriggle out of her arms to run toward me. No way she could have grasped it, that he was my son, had been my naked, laughing boy in another land. And on the high Atlantic, age one, swaying on a deck, the life preserver's arch, hugged by both arms, an orange wicket around him, touching his head, his feet on salt planks, and a captain's cap on his head in augury, and she too mine, now that these mothers are so young, children holding children, daughter holding, dear son laughing, welcome eyed, bread to offer in both fists. And I went home right after that and had the phone call telling me my son was dead. So um, it was as if uh, I had been told before the phone call. OK. Um, we don't have to be formal. Any questions? We didn't think about that. But happy to entertain a couple of questions. Answers, that's really what I would like. <laughs> okay, well, I think we have some refreshments, right?